Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Charlie Badenhop. So Charlie is originally from New York, but has lived in Japan for quite a while now. Uh, he's been a martial arts sensei there, one of the few foreigners to do that. Extensively trained in various kinds of body work. Um, also in NLP and has worked with corporate groups, various kind of big name corporate groups, people you've probably heard of, like uh, I know Ericsson, Toyota, all sorts of people, Barclays. Um, so Charlie, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Nice to be here. And it's, it's morning here in Brighton, and I believe afternoon there in Japan? Yeah, about four o'clock here in... Uh, no, I'm in Thailand, actually. Four You're in Thailand here. today? Well, I'm living in Thailand now. Oh, you're living in Thailand. I didn't know that. I, I know you were living in Japan for a long time, but you've, you've moved to Thailand, right? Yes, three, three and a half years ago, I moved to Thailand. Okay, so what's your story of the body? How did you get interested in the body as a field of study? Uh, I had a lot of trouble with my legs and feet as a kid. And uh, I had to wear these special shoes with metal plates in them. And anyway, by the time I was 21 years old, I, I was having trouble, trouble driving my car, just the, you know, the kind of pressure you keep on the uh, gas pedal and everything. And I felt like if I don't do something about this, I'm going to be crippled by, you know, a very early age. And that started me on my path. And that was in, in the United States? That was in New York City where I grew up, yeah. And so did you start studying Aikido there and then move to Japan? What, what was the journey to Japan? Well, as far as I started this study with someone uh, where we used to do some things that were like, say, Feldenkrais and Alexander. And then this teacher said to me, you know, I really think you ought to try Aikido. And I did Aikido for about a year in, in New York City. And I got I sold a business that I had. And I thought, here's an opportunity to really go check what the big boys are doing. And I moved there not knowing if I'd stay a month or two. And 30 years later, I was moving out finally. Wow. So you spent 30 years in Japan. And you're actually teaching martial arts there? I mean, there's not many people who have done that. Yeah. I, my teacher was Tohei Sensei. He was one of the top five or six people in Aikido ever, I believe. And I became one of his teachers. And I taught for him, I don't know, I'm going to say maybe 15 years in his dojo. And... <laughs> and when people used to come from overseas and see me instead of a Japanese guy standing there, they were always disappointed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a way in which people want their teachers to be Oriental, isn't there? Yeah. And how was that experience, actually, as, as a Westerner teaching Japanese martial arts in Japan? You know, it took me about a... I, the first three years I was there, I studied, believe it or not, 30 hours a week in the dojo, which was a little insane, but I, I tend to be compulsive. And it took about a year uh, for me to be accepted by the other, like the Japanese senseis. And actually that happened when I cut my hair. Someone told me, cut your hair short. And I cut my hair short and the next day they started using my name. And uh, it was great. It was, it was a real experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And we've had Aikido people on the show before, but Paul Linda and Miles Kessler, but you're from the Ki Aikido background, the Tohei Sensei lineage. So can you explain a little bit about what Ki Aikido is for the, for the listeners? Tohei Sensei, I believe, well, I know, understood how to get into the nervous system past the muscle. So uh, almost no one ever got hurt in our dojo. And Toei Sensei could take the biggest person, the strongest person. He did it on TV and everywhere else. And for instance, he could just drop them down to the ground as if, as if they were weaklings or something. So little by little, I learned from him how to get inside the person's nervous system to be able to get things to happen. And, as far, and I've studied with a lot of other different Aikido people, including in Japan. And he's the only one that seemed to even have an idea about that. Yes. So, I mean, as I understand it, he was kind of the founder of Aikido. He's really top student. And then there was this schism when the founder died and the kind of, you know, his son, the founder's son took over the mainstream Aikido and Tohei kind of went his own way. And he combined it with a system of, I guess you could call it Japanese yoga. And it has this reputation as being the sort of softer start side of Aikido, right? Uh, nothing at all about Japanese yoga. He created something that he called Kiyatsu. Uh-huh. Uh, instead of shiatsu, she means finger, actually, mm -hmm. shiatsu means finger pressure. 
and and kiatsu was you were meant to be pressing with the key you're using your finger but the the, the idea is you're sending key into the person's body and and for, for those that are new to the word what is what is key key is the universal life energy that we all have that that keeps the clock ticking uh-huh and it was certainly, you know, Terry Sensei is, 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 was known for doing some quite incredible things with this as well, right? He could really put his, put his money where his mouth was. Well, he used to teach around the world and, and he'd have a big audience show up. And then at the end of the demonstration, he'd say, anybody in the audience that'd like to come up and spar with me, uh, regardless of, you know, whether you're karate, judo, taekwondo, and, and he'd take on all comers. Yeah, there was there's a, there's a key affiliated dojo affiliated to that school in in Brighton where I live, and it's it's not my main style. But once I was there, just you know cross training, seeing what it was about, and uh, the teacher just said, you know, hit me as hard as you can, kind of thing. And this was in, when I was in my twenties. I was pretty vigorous, full of testosterone, and uh, you know I was just tr- trying to hit this doing a yoka minuchi, which is a basic kind of side strike, and I was really going at him hard, and um, it, it, very softly that was just kind of being deflected. And he was taking my balance. And I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, you know, martial arts are designed for smaller, weaker people to be able to protect themselves against larger, stronger people. Mm. And there are a lot of people, even in Aikido, that are using muscle and force to get someone down. But that, to me, kind of is against the principles that you're really trying to develop. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it seemed like the key school have particularly worked on sort of principles for life. You know, there seems to be... Uh, like a set of principles that are kind of in that school that are applicable to all across life, not just in the martial arts context. Yeah, well, as I think a lot of martial artists would say, uh, you know, you don't really want to ever be using your martial art as such out in the real world. Yeah. uh, By getting in fights or even if you claim to be protecting yourself, most of the time you can run away. Yeah. And so, yeah, you want to take the training and how can you use it like I've taught conflict negotiation, anger management, a lot of topics like that, using uh, the principles of Ki Aikido. And, you know, I've heard the founder of karate say, you know, if you use karate once, as in physically using it, then that's that's just bad luck. If you use it twice, you're probably sick. That's what he would say. And that's quite a strong statement. You know, I mean, Japan's a very safe place, but... Yeah, well, you know, in Japan, because I had a a license to teach... Mm. If I would have ever gotten in in a fight and and you know rather seriously hurt someone, I would have gotten arrested. You're right. Okay, so, so they take that pretty seriously. Good, uh, yes. And it is interesting, isn't it, that as I understand it, Japan's one of the safest countries in the world. I just saw an article about how the police are so bored; they're sort of finding obscure cr- crimes to keep busy, and yes. that martial arts are in this place where most people just simply aren't interested in in self defense because it, it doesn't make sense. There's no reason to unless you're in the prison service or something like that. Yeah, well, you know, with Aikido, and and I can't really talk about other martial arts. Mm. I mean, I've studied a fair bit of Tai Chi, but uh, mainly a dilettante there, is you're actually cultivating what you could call your somatic intelligence or your enteric nervous system. So I think that's one of the big tasks. You're, You're learning how to, sometimes I playfully say, you're learning how to think without thinking. Uh, but you're certainly learning how to be in life and act in life without needing to think. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where a lot of the deeper learning comes if, if you stay with it long enough. Nice. And I'm, I'm really curious about this cultural experience. You know, I've had Japanese friends at university. I've had Japanese teachers. I'm going there for the first time probably next year, but I've never been there yet. And I, uh, you know, I've, I've studied various aspects of Japanese culture, calligraphy, martial arts, various things. And it's also a culture that's fascinated me. And I've also, you know, I've had very, various friends that studied Aikido there. Some of them have had quite a hard time. They found it quite racist. Um, others want, sort of embraced it fully and almost lost their kind of European roots. How, how was it for you living there for 30 years as a son of a fireman from New York? I mean, that's a pretty big culture difference, right? You know, all foreigners are called gaijin. And gai means outside and jin means person. So you're an outside person. And that accords you a lot of benefits, and that will also keep you out of a lot of places or a lot of possibilities that you could get as a Japanese. So it's always a double-edged sword, and you just need to take the benefits from it and let the, let the rest slide. Mm. Like, 
even uh, in the higher rankings of Aikido, they, in Japan, they don't want foreigners uh, having those higher ranks. And you yep. get to a, a stage where they're almost certainly not going to promote you anymore. You know? Yeah, there's for a long time there's a system in all of the world outside of Japan where the Japanese teacher who was in the United States or France or Britain or wherever was always one degree higher than the nearest Western person. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, at least, yes. So there'd be like, you know, this if you were like Yamada Sensei would be eighth Dan and the nearest guy in New York would be seventh Dan that was, you know, not Japanese or Kanetsuka Sensei would be seventh Dan and the nearest British guy would be sixth Dan. And there was yeah. always this, you know, essentially, I think, racist system that nobody talks about uh, that was there. Well, you know... Japanese culture is very hierarchical. Mm. And for instance, like I'm 69 years old now. So if, if I'm, if I go back to Japan, which I do regularly, if I meet someone in a semi formal setting, if he's younger than me, he's first going to be attuning to me, but then he might be the president of a large corporation. And we have to establish those things. So we know how to talk to each other properly without insulting uh, either person, insulting the other person. Uh -huh. um, I would say that Japanese culture can be very xenophobic. Uh, and everything in Japan, it's what they call like uda and omote. It has a front and a back. Mm -hmm. And almost always towards the front, people are going to be very polite. And then you might leave the room and they might say, who was that? you know, foolish guy or something like that. And you just got to understand that uh, telling the truth, as we know it in, in the West, is not of importance. Right. The, the, the main important thing is to not create conflict with other people. Yeah, the war. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and also I, I learned working with Japanese senseis to read between the lines, you know? Like there was a Japanese teacher and we were looking after him one evening and we, we were like, okay, so we're in a bar and he looks like he's having a good time and we, he's drinking with some Aikido guys after class. And we're like, okay, sensei, so we're really kind of tired. Or we're thinking of going to bed. Is it okay if we leave you here? You know, you know your accommodation's just next door. You know the way. Is, is it cool to leave you here? And he was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And we, we went to bed. And the next day we got like shouted at like, like hey, why did you leave the sensei on his own? And we, and we said, well, because he said he didn't mind. And, and, like, they were, and the, the more senior teachers were like, well, of course he said that, but he didn't mean that. He wanted you to stay. And the, we didn't read between the lines. And, we, you know, we should have been, like, looking at the implicit communication and not just what was said. Yeah, well, certainly as in Japan, uh, even a foreigner like me, I mean, I would never, ever leave the sensei and... I don't mind having a drink or two, but there was a lot of times I stayed out much later than I wanted to. And part of the part of the idea, which is frustrating to both Japanese and Gaijin, is you're supposed to be able to read the person's key, which can be quite problematic when they're very purposefully not telling you what they would prefer to have happen. Yeah, nobody ever says no, right? You have to kind of go, okay, so... I get that you don't want to come, but I've invited you to this party, but you don't want to come now. So I'm going to sort of disinvite you because I can figure out that's not really what you want. And you're not ever going to say no to me. So I have to just feel that even though you're hiding it, you actually would prefer not to come. This is a very implicit way of doing things. Yeah, except you, <laughs> you got to learn how to do it without that many number of steps in your thinking. <laughs> right. Like there's a, there was a great book written a number of years ago called, I think it was called polite fictions or polite lies uh -huh. and so in america if you came to my house i was living there and we're friends and i said hey mark there's you know beer in the fridge if you want and i'm just in the process of finishing an email or something yeah okay and you'd say oh thanks and most likely take a beer if you drink yeah if i did that in japan i would really be disrespecting you so i would never say even to my best friend hey there's beer in the fridge uh, let me finish this email yeah so there's this different set of rules. You have to learn the rules. Uh, it can be really frustrating. And, and again, I, I took a lot of great stuff out of Japan and happy I was there. And yes, there's definitely frustrations. Mm, yeah, I think it would drive me nuts, but I prefer the more explicit cultures that people just tell you straight. But uh, it's a matter of preference, maybe. Britain's a little bit like that, actually. We're, I think, more like that than, say, New York. 
in terms of that cultural spectrum. Like traditionally, Eng- England particularly, rather than wider Britain, has been much more implicit than, you know, when I was in America and people would say, hey, what do you earn? You know, I'd be like, well, you know, it's a very crude question. You know what I mean? Like it's very direct. And uh, I remember being taken aback a few times on the East Coast particularly. Yeah. Okay, so what kind of body work have you studied then? Because I understand you've done loads of stuff, so I'd love to hear about some of the kind of body influences in you. I'm looking at your CV here, and there's all kinds of stuff like Seitai and Seiki Jitsu, things I don't even know what they are. So I'd be curious to hear yeah. what kind of stuff well, you've studied. Starting out, like pretty much everybody at the time, I, I studied some what was called Swedish massage, and then it turned out a person happened to become a very good friend of mine. I studied Shiatsu. I actually studied some Feldenkrais with Moshe Feldenkrais. Uh, I studied Alexander Technique with this woman, Marjorie Bates, which was, who was considered his senior student. And then I studied with an amazing healer that had lots of different body technique, but was also able to use energy to heal people. And then I got to Japan, and there's something called Noguchi Seitai. Noguchi is the sensei's name. Mm-hmm. Seitai means, you could call it a uh, properly ordered body, <laughs> uh, meaning, you know, things should be in a, in a certain way in the body. And, and, and prior to coming to Japan, I had also studied cranial sacral. And I would call Noguchi Seitai the oriental version of cranial sacral therapy. Okay. So you, you learn how to sense the cranial pulsing and when you can influence that, and it's very subtle, it takes a long time to be able to really feel it, you can create some profound changes for people. Like when I've worked on people with very serious conditions, there was a few times where they, for like 20, 30 minutes, even an hour once, they looked like they were having like a minor epileptic fit as their whole nervous system was reorganizing. And then they would get up, usually feel very, very, very tired, and then they'd call me the next day and say, oh, my God, I don't have the migraine headaches anymore or whatever. So, I mean, all the body work you've done, is there something you find particularly effective or do you find it just depends on the client? I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, you've got wealth of experience here. So, I think the most important thing, and this took me way too long to really understand, is that you have to pace the people that you're working with, you know. And that's particularly tricky when people are saying, gee, I hope this isn't going to take more than three sessions or something like that, you know? So I have to find out what people are going to be comfortable with or not comfortable with. And actually, one of the things I I do a lot, but didn't learn from any particular one person, is I do what you could call it a stomach massage in, in English or a hara massage, where I go into the stomach with my hand, my fingers, both hands, whatever, and find out what's happening and quiet down the enteric nervous system. Uh, so I like to do that a lot. And I can do lots of different uh, adjustments similar to chiropractic adjustments. And then a fair amount of the work I do is also teaching pers- uh, people simple exercises that they can do on their own and feel more empowered. Yeah. They don't need me uh, all the time. Yeah, it's one of the things I struggle with with body work is the, you know, A, it's pretty expensive. I'm going to pay 50 pounds a session every time or, you know, 100 bucks a session. And um, I have to get to that practitioner. I travel a lot. I might not be able to, you know, I might lose half a day of work to get across town to their office. And it's like, you know, having things I can do myself can be really, really helpful. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to, I taught a lot of workshops for many years and one of the reasons I love workshops is it can make your work a lot more accessible and affordable to the average person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, one of the thick worries I have, you know, is so much of this body work or not, you know, embodiment generally that's spreading around the world. is just like, you know, we're going to do trickle down embodiment. Cause I mean, what percentage of the world can afford like a bunch of yoga classes every week, plus body work every week, plus maybe therapy, you know, it's a very small percentage of the world, even in the UK, let alone the rest of the world, that can afford that kind of tuition, you know? I, I suggest more people move to Thailand. Is that the place uh, to do it, huh? Well, I'm taking uh, three yoga classes a week with a wonderful uh, woman. 
and I won't go into the difference in currencies. So <clears throat> she was going to be charging me yeah. uh, $3 and 50 cents a one hour session. Yeah. And I, the, the round off on the currency was to me awkward. So I was, I, I give her $5 a session. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I just spoke to a friend that was in Thailand having a kind of massage every single day, you know, for the equivalent of three pounds a massage. But again, you know, is that's just really just taking advantage of the currency difference that we have. And I, it's not yeah. sustainable kind of long term. Right. And it's, it, and again, it's like, if we want to look at this as more than just something that luxurious Westerners can afford while on a beach in Goa or Thailand, you know what I mean? It's like, as a long term yeah. thing to change the world, I'm like, okay, what's the, what's the, what's the thing that can really, be sustainable for large sections of the world and i and the one-to-one body work is pretty tr- pretty tricky as a as a, as a proposition just because of the, the cost a lot of people have a lot of belief in in medical doctors and medical yeah. doctors can do a lot of great things and i think there's a lot of things that they're they're not as good at so the first thing is do people even have the desire to work on themselves and to not just go in and like get some tablets and it's done. Mm. And, and my understanding is most medication, particularly in the kind of work that you and I are doing, if we're talking about people taking antidepressants, for instance, uh, there's a lot of contraindications. And if you look at all the list of the contraindications, I wonder how people even take these medications in the first place. Yeah. So yes, the, the expense of getting good work. Yeah. Big deal, uh, and then as the practitioner, we need to make a, a reasonable living. So, I don't think there's a simple answer to that, or at least not one that I've figured out yet. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you say it's partly expense, but it's also mindset. Like, if if in my mindset is like, hey, I've got this problem, I want to fix it. No, you know, give me a pill, give me a one shot deal. You know, um, as opposed to like, hey, I'm really going to have to work on myself and confront myself, and it may take energy and time. I mean, that's not, not, not a particularly attractive proposition to many people. Yeah, well, and also because we, in the West, there isn't a culture, there isn't a cultural background that, that really makes that likely. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, when I used to teach corporate workshops, certainly years ago, the very first thing you'd get asked is, I hope this isn't going to be touchy-feely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've just come back from teaching one in Sweden and that was like the fear in the room. Actually, I'd love to speak a bit more about the sort of doing this body stuff in corporates because um, actually it's my, it's my work, but actually you're one of the few guests we've had on the show who's, you know, work, you've worked extensively in some fairly big corporations, right? And, and in Japan as well. So it's, it's not a particularly fluffy corporate environment. It ain't Northern California there, right? Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> The biggest thing is when you're working in a corporation, in my mind, is who hires you and, yeah. and, what, and what wherewithal, what power, what, what visibility, not necessarily power, and, and um, reputation do they have in the corporation. Yep. And so actually, like with Toei Sensei, uh, he established numerous corporate dojos, and they would actually build a dojo within the corporate headquarters or you know, one of the corporate bigger buildings. And they have the idea of working on themselves. Yeah. Not because I think something's wrong with me kind of thing. Yeah. Like what, what Japanese people used to say, and I'm sure a fair amount of them do say, if, if they said something like, oh, my God, you hear that, that Mark's getting therapy? And, and someone else would say, yeah, I think that's the problem that he has. In other words, going to therapy showed that you had a kind of weakness Okay. In the world. Yeah. And so you're meant to somehow figure it out on your own. Uh huh. Get some kind of training, but the training isn't like how to be a better person or how to be a nicer guy. The training is some kind of spiritual discipline that a little bit will grind you down and a little bit will open you up to a bigger world. And this is a, a common idea in Japanese culture generally, isn't it? Like, like the, the idea of Budo is pretty well established. The martial ways are pretty, you know, Kendo and Judo are pretty well established in schools. And I, as I, you know, there's this, I don't know if it's still true that companies actually kind of have a, almost a remit, like doing exercise with everyone on the factory floor in the morning. I mean, things like that you just wouldn't do in, in England. You can, you know, make yeah. all the workers in a steel mill in Sheffield do aerobics in the morning. I'd say to fuck yeah, well, off. The, the, those exercises <clears throat> 
are very old fashioned and cobbled together from different Western ideas. And yeah. they're certainly not going to give a lot of benefit to people in my mind. Uh -huh. But yes, they'll get the whole shop floor out there uh, doing it and counting together. And it's also a good way to bring people together. So team building, right? Movement. Yes. When we move in a group, whether it's a hacker or a football chant or anything, it's a way of coordinating groups and bonding them. Yes. And also something is when you get people breathing together, whether they're doing any specific movements or not, when you get people breathing together, you get people bonding. Yeah, for sure. And like, like singing is an example of that, isn't it? When choirs are singing together, you know, you, you, there's, there's various examples of that or liturgy in a church where everyone says the same thing at the same time. It's, exactly. uh, and so, so say more about your experience doing corporate work. What kind of stuff were you doing and, and how did it go down? Always had to be really careful to take baby steps and once again to pace people. You know, so like, for instance, the average Japanese person knows nothing about Aikido. They don't know anything about, uh, about karate and whatever. They know something for sure about the principles that underlie it, but they don't know how to do it. They don't have the slightest clue. And so I found it was really important to make it a bit of fun and to start off with exercises that everybody that wanted to participate could do. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things I usually did really early on is get people making key eyes. Uh -huh. uh, do you want to say what that is for listeners? You know, and people doing that as a group get a tremendous amount of power. I mean, you can feel when, like, I taught once in Russia to a group of like 500 and something people, and I got them all doing this specific chant. Yeah. Like, it felt like the roof was going to come off the top of the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just for the listeners, a key eye is, is that sound people may have heard when someone does a punch in karate, the hey. Or the, 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 the sound, spirit, spirit cry, right? Yes. And it actually, well, you actually don't have to make the sound. Key I means, key is the universal energy. I means gathering. So you're gathering the universal energy and then putting it out in the world. And you could be watching, a, let's say, a golf tournament on TV in Japan. And the, the announcer or the commentator might say, I don't, I, I don't think this is going to make this putt. I don't feel as key I. You're right. So people get used to, get attuned to feeling it. Yeah, there's a lot of sayings in Japanese about ki, isn't there? Like just in daily life, it's you know, people that even might not have any training, but there's lots and lots of sayings that people are using regularly. Yeah, well, in fact, and this is good for people that are judgmental with themselves, the term ki otsukete would be normally translated as pay attention. So let's say I drop a plate. Mm. Uh, that I was watching and it breaks, I'm in your house and you say, geez, Charlie, key, let's get there. What it really means is attach your key to what you're doing. Right. You can to attach. So you can look at it and go, I must have been thinking about something else, otherwise I wouldn't have dropped the dish. So you can say that to yourself instead of calling yourself clumsy or stupid or something like that. So, mm -hmm. and And yes, there's lots of key, there's, you know, 10 key is weather and this key is in, in, in a lot of different words. In yeah. There. Raise your key. And I, I remember reading a very interesting little article. It was by Stanley Prannan. who was the, uh, the um, editor of Aikido journal. And he went to Japan with his 15 year old American daughter. And she wrote a cute little article. It was like school report, you know, and it was really interesting what she said. She said, she said, in Japan, in some ways, it's like America. They have TV and they have, you know, baseball. But she said, but they do everything really carefully. And that was her main takeaway. She said that people were more, that the emphasis on doing things with attention, with the key attached to it, was something she noticed even as a 15-year-old kid. And she didn't have any sophisticated language to talk about it. She just said, they're careful in Japan. And I thought that was a very interesting little observation. Yeah, they, they do. I mean, all of these are generalizations, of course, but they do, as a whole, strive to do things as perfectly as possible. There's the idea of, of Kaizen, isn't there? Sort of continuous improvement, of refining things. Yes. And, and that's why in the Japanese factories, uh, they, get, they get tons of ideas from the workers. Yeah. <clears throat> and they do make these little, uh, like I worked for Toyota for a little while, 
and they make so many small improvements in the manufacturing process. And at the end of the year, they can say, let's say making a Corolla uh, is costing us 15% less compared to last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that 15% is a big difference in terms of profit or efficiency or energy. I have a Slavic friend and they work in a casino and they're trying to do Kaizen there. And, you know, someone's going around and saying, what little suggestions do you have? And my friend's just like, oh, it's good enough. It's fine. You know, she just wants to show up to work and get paid. And, it, and it's, it's kind of like culturally for her, it's like, why are you worrying about this small 5%, you know, not realizing that those, those things add up? Yes. Yes. So you were doing a lot of stress management work. Is that right? I'm looking at your website here and there's a lot about stress management. Was that one of the main? Yeah, I, I brain- created a course that I'd like to think is special. Um, I mean, actually, I'm going to, I'm slowly in the process of, of moving the entire course over to YouTube. Mm. Um, because, yeah, like I say, I'm 69 years old. I'm doing other things. And it was costing me a lot of time and money to maintain my site properly. Uh, oh. But, yes, I developed the stress management program. And a lot of it is what I would like to playfully call, like, everyday hypnosis. Okay. Well, what does so, that mean? So that means just slowing down and, like, on a tape. with We, we even... Uh, composed our own music for the course just slowing down put your both feet on the floor uh, on the floor your hands either on your lap and just going through things slowly take a deep breath and really do that you know and with some good suggestions and with some well chosen music people come away feeling more relaxed I mean, this is leading us into talking about NLP and, and you are the first NLP person we've had on. So I, you know, just for complete people have never heard of it, or maybe they've got some sense of it. What is NLP? And then let's dig into that a little bit. There's a lot of people that have a lot of different ideas about NLP and it's not all positive. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I, I did a lot of work with John Grinder and Judy Delosier. I taught with them a number of times and, and John Grinder early on, w- once I came aboard said, NLP is the verbal explication, explication of Aikido. Aikido is the nonverbal explication of NLP. So you can look at NLP as a way to learn how to be more fully alive and to do things more gracefully and artfully. Uh, NLP is mainly used, well, certainly in the beginning, was mainly using language patterns to help people do that. So like if I was your client and I said, I'm always uh, doing stupid things in NLP, you might say, what if you changed it just a little bit and said, I often do stupid things. Uh So looking at how we train ourselves through language, the language we use to make ourselves victims or to make something permanent that doesn't need to be permanent or whatever. Yes. And then if we use this, this idea about the kiosk, get the attach your key to what you're doing. What if you then said, I often don't attach my key to what I'm doing and therefore I don't get great results. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath. That's right. Why don't you sit with that for a little while and see what, what difference shows up in your life? Yeah. So, uh, like John with John Grinder or Judy, they would teach reframing. And then they'd call me up and I'd show some NL, I'd, I'd show some Aikido techniques that were actually doing reframing, mm-hmm. you know, um, and a lot of the other uh, kind of things. So it became, after a while, I couldn't remember what I learned from John and what I learned from Toei Sensei mm-hmm. because it was a lot of the same information. And I think certainly the way Toei Sensei did Aikido, you were... Once you start moving with someone that's looking at to attack you, it creates a bit of confusion with them and creates what I would call a positively oriented trance. And when you have that person in a in a positively oriented trance, since you're not looking to hurt them anyway, you have the opportunity to bring the conflict to a you know reasonably quick uh, close. Yeah. So not all that different than doing coaching or whether it's hypnosis or whatever. And someone starts off being aggressive and you say, okay, so I'm understanding that you're angry today, I think. When you say that, a person that's angry 
isn't expecting, in my mind, isn't expecting a pleasant response. Yeah, so that's the blend in Aikido, right? So normally in physical confrontation, someone pushes you, they push you back. You know, that's all, right. that's the, in, in, you know, the kind of intuitive response. And the same verbally, someone says, you're an asshole, you say, no, you're an asshole. And instead of saying, oh, you think I'm an asshole, that's really interesting. Like, like it sounds like I pissed you off. What, what's going on there? You know, like actually getting curious and blending and going alongside them, which in Aikido we're literally physically doing, right? We're literally getting side by side with someone and looking in the same direction before leading them. And yes. I, that's the kind of verbal Aikido. It, 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 creates, it creates a moment where the person's not sure what's going on. Mm. And when you can literally enter into those moments, either uh, with words or with physical action, the person is very susceptible to being moved or being changed. You know, kind of like if you're, if you're walking down the stairs and you begin to slip a little bit, you grab for the handrail, not even knowing if there's, you know, glass sticking up from it or whatever, you yeah. just grab for the handrail. Yeah. So uh, when people are upset or angry, they're sometimes trying to grab for you because they don't know what else to do. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I, I, my experience is that if one is relaxed and kind of blending in those situations, people can't keep attacking you for long. You know, there's this feeling of good Aikido where you feel kind of, you're like end up on the floor and you're sort of smiling, you know, you're like, how did that happen? And yes. it, it's difficult to sustain aggression in the face of that. Like there's a way in which resistance uh, creates more aggression. Yes, absolutely. And, and the thing is, whether, like, okay, actually, you mentioned this teacher said to you, punch me. It used to be one of the most common things I would do if I saw like a karate guy came into the class. Yeah. And I knew looking to have a, a shot at me, I would give him that shot. And when... When someone punches you, when you actually say, punch me, let's say I say it to you, when you punch me, you're following my lead. You're following my suggestion. Yeah. You see? And all I have to do in that moment is, for, for instance, either move in two or three centimeters and, and the, the full power of your punch doesn't reach me or move yeah. back two or three centimeters. And so when you've given me your best shot <clears throat> and I'm still standing there, it's like, Oh shit! What do I do now? Yeah, <clears throat> and and whether it's like you somebody goes to hit you and doesn't quite reach you, yeah. In my mind, it also creates a bit of confusion for them. What else in terms of like your work stuff that you've done? I'm I'm curious to hear more stories from you. Any instances or uh, and you know also we could go down the route of things people could try at home. You know things that that, that uh, might be useful for people listening to this. Um, I haven't thought about that yet. But one of the things I do often when I'm in, uh, like if I'm doing a workshop, so I might say, so usually lots of people in the room have a problem. Who has a problem they'd like to come up uh, and discuss here? You don't have to tell your personal details. You know, like you can say, someone I'm close to, I'm angry at. Yeah. It's your, your boss. So I pull them up and then I say to them, uh, they're facing the audience and I say, is it okay if I adjust your posture some while you're talking? Yeah. Okay. If they said no, I'd have to pick somebody else. Uh, so as they're talking, I make these subtle adjustments to their posture, which for the first time in their life for most people, they'll actually be truly balanced. Mm -hmm. So the weight will be falling through their pelvis down into their feet. And what happens when they get there, they're not able to talk about their problem in the way that they're used to. Yeah, by, by adjusting someone's embodiment, that they're, they're, it forces them to change their perspective on whatever issue it was, yeah? Yeah, well, I can, I can tell you now with, <clears throat> with the yoga that I'm doing, there's been a few classes where I just come out feeling a little bit like I'm somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> my teacher has helped me to get to a place that I've never been able to get to before. Uh, I don't know all the things that are happening to me internally, but like, let's say I stand up and I just go, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the world looks different. I remember a very good Alexander technique teacher, Bruce Furtman. He was in Japan for a while, actually. And uh, he just changed my posture. And it was like, literally, the room looked different. And yes. my thinking and my speech was very different. Yes. So 
most pe- almost everybody stands in a way that's posterior, posterior, which means you're tilted backwards a little bit. Mm. There are very, very few people that stand in a balanced way. And when you're tilted backwards, you're going to be that much more accessing your past rather than your present and or the future. Yeah. So when you adjust somebody's posture to where they're no longer uh, defaulting towards the past, just that will make their description of the relationship. Like someone might say, you know, my best friend Fred is, is such an idiot. They start out saying, and after their posture gets adjusted, they might want, with me giving no input, they might say, you know what, I think I'm too rough on my friend Fred sometimes, and, mm-hmm. and I ought to be a little softer with him. You know, isn't it funny that we, we think our perspective is so logical that, you know, it's the truth. And even just like, and you know, maybe this is something people could try that are kind of standing listening to this or sitting listening to this as they travel around. It's just even something as simple as coming away from the heels onto the more to the front of the foot or, yeah. or vice versa can, can completely change our point of view. Well, okay, if you want to do something just to fool around, but in a, in a, in a good way, get like um, not a New York City telephone book that's way too thick, although you could use that. Even get two or three magazines, put them under one foot and the other foot standing on the ground and start discussing something with yourself, a relationship, whatever. Mm. You'll start to feel a little off. And that's why you don't want to use something really thick. You don't want your one leg bent and yeah. your other one straight. Huh? Um, and if you're with someone that can actually tell you, let's say, for instance, your left hip is higher than your right hip mark, and you say, okay, put the magazines under your right side and your hips will actually become more balanced. So there's lots of little ways like that that you can, or just come up on the balls of your feet and discuss something. Yeah. You know, the idea is do anything different. Doing yeah. anything different is better than continuing to do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, because if, if what you're doing isn't working, then any change is at least a new possibility, right? And I, yeah. I do a coaching thing where I take people through four different postures. We call it, you know, four elements. And in those postures, they're all slightly different. They get four different new ideas. And then yeah. actually, I've never seen a time where someone didn't come up with a new idea in every posture. So worst case scenario, they've got four new ideas for their problem. And yeah. then afterwards, I say, okay, so which one do you want to go with? And nearly always one of them is like, wow, I didn't realize I could ask someone for help or I didn't realize I could just not stress about this. And they're yeah. like, Shit, where? and logically, none of the ideas are particularly radical but they just would not have come to those ideas had they been in the same old habitual embodiment. Yes. And, you know, I think like if it's around noontime and my stomach makes a little growling sound or whatever, I look at my watch uh, and I go, oh, I'm hungry. Yeah. It does that at 10 o'clock in the morning. I might think, oh, maybe I had too many beers last night or something, you know? Yeah. So the thing is, if you simply... If I have a client and, and, I'm, and that client says I'm depressed, for instance, I go, please tell me the physical sensations that you're having that lead you to feel depressed. Yeah. And in the beginning, with almost all clients, they'll just go, huh? Yeah. They have no idea. Yeah. So they're, they're not really feeling themselves. They're labeling the feeling as depression, just like I label at 12 o'clock that stomach activity as hunger. Yeah. So you can actually start deconstructing uh, the conversations you have by continually asking yourself, what are the physical sensations that are going along with that? Yeah. And the actual, as you say, the actual sensations or even actions in the body rather than the kind of gestalt, which is labeled. That's like one step removed, right? Like I call this, this whole bunch of unconscious sensations. I call this, this yeah. thing. Yes. Yes. And then once we label it, uh, even more so we stop paying attention to it. Yeah. And I already know what that is. And there's a possibility to change it as well. Right? Like if I, you can't, if you say to someone, just don't be depressed, well, what does that mean? How do I do that? But if it's like, okay, notice that you tilt your chin down, well, that's something I can work with. Yes. I think that we want to help people become more aware. We could call that mindful. We could call it a lot of other things. And 
And one of the things that I like to try to do is get people to put a space in between the stimulus and the response. Mm -hmm. So in an adversarial situation, like you said, before you call me an idiot, I go, you're an idiot too, immediately. Yeah. You know, if you call me an idiot and I take two deep breaths, even if I do say you're an idiot, it's going to come out differently. Yeah, and nobody sits there and goes, you know what would be a really smart move now is calling this guy an idiot back. Like, that's not a good strategy 99 times out of 100, right? Yeah, it's a default. Yeah. You know, so, but you can, you can use, if you learn how to put a space in between the stimulus and the response, you know, taking a deep breath. Like sometimes I'll say to a client, let us know, or let's say I'm doing a workshop. I want to know why you're here today, but please don't talk yet. Hmm. Take two deep breaths before you tell me. So either you can see that they don't take the two deep breaths because they really want to get into the problem, and I have to ask them to stop and please first take the two deep breaths. So just simply even that, why are you here today? Yep. Breath one, breath two is going to lead to some change in the statement that you're going to make. And usually it's going to ameliorate it some and, and, and make it softer. Yeah. I mean, I do that a lot of coaching clients. I say, look, I want to save you 10 minutes of bullshit. Just take a breath, put your feet on the ground. I know you think there's a reason why you're here, but before you do that, couple of breaths. Okay. Now tell me what you've come for, what you want to get from today's session, which is the classic coaching question, right? But it's like coming from a different place. And all of a sudden we've just saved 15 minutes of mental chatter and they go, right. The real issue is this. Yes. You can even do it before and after, you know, where someone says, blah, 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 blah. And then you go, okay, take a breath. Tell me again why you're here. And they just go, boom, like one cut deeper. You just save like a whole coaching session and they've got to the thing that you can actually work with. Yes. And, you know, I, I mentioned before that I, I think in, in martial arts, we're looking to cultivate a healthier enteric nervous system. And I just say, for, because most people certainly don't know, is that the enteric nervous system, which comes from the esophagus down into the intestinal tract, produces all of the body's serotonin. And it does this without direction from the brain in your skull. One of the main ways that serotonin gets produced is through the digestive process, okay? So when people are studying yoga, martial arts, whatever, they're becoming more aware of their center. The digestive activity is going to tend to get healthier, which means the serotonin production and reuptake is going to be healthier. Yeah. And people are going to be able to seriously help themselves with depression without even talking about depression. Because as I sometimes playfully say, you know, frankly, I find talking about depression a, a really depressing subject. <laughs> so the more people can, can get some results without even needing to talk about it, the better they wind up feeling themselves about themselves simply because they're involved in, in a healthy process that doesn't Need, we don't need to first talk about my problems. Yeah, and it often just goes round and round in a boring story, doesn't it, when, when people go there? Yes. Well, I have a good friend from many years ago that has a business card that says de-hypnotist. And so, of course, that's a great way to start a conversation. Everybody always says, what is a de-hypnotist? He says, I'm looking to help you get out of the trance that you walked into the room with. <laughs> nice. And... People often talk about fight or flight, but the kind of rest and digest is the other side of things, right? So supporting that side of things. Yes, and that's and and the, certainly the fight and flight uh, is the space in between the stimulus and the response. And before we actually started recording today, you were talking a little bit about like the language of the nervous system. I was intrigued by that. Maybe you could come back to that. Prior to having verbal language, we have um, what I would call other people would call it this also. A somatic language. I mean, a baby very much knows when they're hungry and, and so forth and so on. Huh? So <clears throat> prior to being able to talk, we have developed many strategies and ways for being in the world. And so an elevated heart rate, a constriction of your blood pressure, 
or a heightening of your blood pressure, constriction of the arteries, is going to lead you to say, depending on exactly what your situation is, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm hyper, uh, I have hypertension, so forth and so on. But what you'll find is that the reactions that you're having are totally habitual in nature. So, for instance, if, if I ask a client, uh, take a moment, think of a, um, a situation you don't like, they'll start rocking ever so much, either front to back or left to right. And I don't tell them that ahead of time. And I say, thank you for thinking of that. Now, think of something that gives you a lot of pleasure in life. They, they will always have that really micromuscular rock in a different direction. So let's say I'm, I'm working with you and you're saying I'm, I'm really depressed and I notice you always go ever so much to left to right. I might come up, put my hands on your head, get you rocking a little bit front to back and tell me, and I'll purposely say, tell me about your depression and you'll be a little bit confused and you'll start being more solution oriented. And, and you might even say like, you know, maybe I just take things too seriously sometimes. Yeah. So they with every topic, because we're always responding about things that have emotional content, huh? uh, otherwise we're not talking about stuff. Mm -hmm. so it, whether we mention topics like killing someone or you know, like general topics, or whether we mention when, when that guy got uh, fired from his job or whatever, their body does a whole reaction, and from, it's that reaction that leads them to develop the verbal content. So those reactions when put together is what I call somatic language. And it's at least as sophisticated, complete and complex as verbal language. And I believe it's what verbal language is based upon. This primary is what you just said as well, right? Yes. You know, Interesting. and if we add perhaps three eyes or four arms or something, seriously, our language would be quite different. Right. So language coming out of our embodiment. Yes. So that's where I, I and, and again, this relates to putting a space in between the stimulus and the response is I strive to help people to get back to the reaction that they have that comes before the words. That's an yeah. NLP. We'd call that the deep structure of your experience. Deep structure of experience. I like that. So there's something there's something kind of primary that comes before the kind of verbal explanation, you know? The, the verbal explanation is always, in a way of thinking, literally an afterthought. And the other thing is that the brain doesn't feel sensation. Yeah. Uh, when my, my mom, bless her soul, died at about 91 years old. And, she, and when people ask me why she died, I said old age, but she had brain cancer towards the end. And the doctor said, the lucky thing is she won't suffer at all because the brain has no pain receptors. Yeah. So the brain is reporting on what the body feels. Yeah. I mean, you can cut someone's head open and operate without general anesthetic on the brain because yes. it, it's not feeling anything in that directly, right? So that, that's why with this idea of the, of the default uh, uh, neural network, a default node network is... We need to help ourselves or as practitioners help our clients to slow down their explanations and perhaps not even have them, bring them more into the moment. And I think where meditation, for instance, can really help is you can, you can turn what, what your problem was into a positively oriented mantra. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm complaining about being overweight all the time and i can i can try working on a mantra that actually says slim and healthy slim and healthy healthy slim and healthy you know something like that and if you can manage to do that for five or ten minutes at a time okay there's a part of you that might say who the heck are you kidding you're still overweight but you're changing the internal dialogue that goes on in your head mm -hmm. But how does that help with someone's weight? If I tell you today, and in fact, I'm overweight. If, if I tell you, you know, Mark, I'm overweight. And then I, I say to myself 20 times a day, I'm overweight. I'm overweight. Mm. 
going to tend to make me overweight in the future as well. Okay. So if I change up and think, what am I going to be hopefully a year or two from now, slim and healthy, then in order to jumpstart that process, and since time is not linear, I'll tell myself that I'm slim and healthy, not as an attempt to uh, fool myself or anything, but to already put me verbally where I'm going to be when I'm inhabiting that state. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that I can orientate from this as a healthy person. I get, you know, I eat these foods naturally. I do this kind of thing. Yes, yes. And then you also get to listen to your internal dialogue. Who might call you a fat slob or fatso or whatever. And then I would be saying, you know, I know what your positive intention is, that voice. You want me also to be slim and healthy, but you actually have a really lousy strategy for help, helping me to get there, which is by name calling. Yeah. So how could you better help me? And then we could both be working on the same task. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, Charlie, this has been rich. We need to start moving towards a wrap up. Is there anything you particularly want to talk about that we haven't touched upon so far? Any kind of questions um, or things frontiers for you? I think we've mostly said everything. I just, I think it's, I think all love begins from self love or all appreciation begins from self appreciation. And one thing that, you know, that I've learned over time is that I really want to be appreciating my clients for the unique and interesting people that they are and not labeling them along with the labels they're using. Mm -hmm. And I found that I also had to appreciate myself a little bit more and able to do that in order to be able to do that. If it was a practitioner listening, I would say, please don't be working on sick people or needy people every day. Work on fantastic people that need your help. You know, the same people. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so when you're looking at yourself, the, the whole thing in, in Japanese arts, they all end with the sound do, aikido, ju, yep. do. It's an artful path that you'll never fully master. So please love yourself while you're on that path because certainly the path is more important than the destination. Yeah. And that, that path idea is very healthy, isn't it? It's not just like, hey, I've done my 200-hour teacher training. I'm now a yoga teacher. It's like, hey, there's a long-term path here, and I can appreciate myself on that path, but it, it, it continues. There's that Japanese idea of refinement and continuously being a student. Yeah, and then you, and then you get to someone that, that's done 5,000 hours of training or whatever, and you go, oh, my God, this person is so much more accomplished than me. And you celebrate it for the both of you. Mm hmm Thank you, Charlie. This is great. Um, in terms of people finding out more about you, your stuff, it's seishindo.org? <laughs> seishindo.org, yeah. So that's S-E-I-S-H-I-N-D-O.org. And is, yeah. is there anywhere else people can find out more about you online? Uh, well, I mean, there's thousands of links to mine. If they type in Charlie Badenhop, B-A-D-E-N-H-O-P, uh, my site's going to come up, articles, podcasts, uh, tons of stuff. Great. And there's some stuff on YouTube as well, isn't there? Yeah, I've got some stuff on YouTube. And a little bit, I'm building that up. But yeah, I've got some stuff on YouTube. Great. Okay. If any links you want me to share, just send those to me. Charlie, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, my friend. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to get more. If you'd like to help us build the Embody Tribe, leave a review on iTunes or share this on your social media. If you're interested in training globally, sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com. Until next time, welcome home to the body.